Good morning, and welcome to Christ Episcopal Church in Needham, Massachusetts. I'm Nick Morris Clement, the rector here, and it's a delight to be worshiping God with you this morning in a sanctuary that extends as far as wherever you are and beyond. Thank you for being here this morning. It's also a delight to welcome back our musicians live. Uh, you can't see them, but they are very much here. Our section leaders, Mark Anderson and Leah Peterson and Lisa Corelli and Grant Fraguele and our associate music director and organist, Charles Rains and our music director, Pam Goody, uh, all are here. Um, you can't see them because they're safely distancing in our chapel uh, and they're wearing masks that make them look a little bit like Daffy Duck, but it allows them to sing and breathe and be safe. So we're delighted that we're all gathered together here this morning to make music. Also want to thank Debbie Rempus, who is here to read our lessons and lead us in our prayers. And thanks to Allie Hurd for embedding our Facebook feed on our website. You can click through to our announcements on the bulletin uh, or in the chat on Facebook. There should be a click through for a bulletin there. And among other things uh, on that bulletin and in that Facebook chat, there are click throughs to online giving. You can now make a pledge payment online or set up a pledge or make a one-time gift online. It is simple. There will also be a click through to our online giving page at the offertory in the bulletin, which comes towards the end of the service uh, in our worship of morning, our morning prayer worship this morning. There also is a place to sign up uh, as a reader or a Facebook usher if you go to our bulletin. Our ministry together depends on your contributions in both these arenas. Uh, helping to lead worship and also um, to contribute as your resources allow. And we thank you for your generosity. Our annual appeal will kick off in a month on October 18th, so please stay tuned for that. And finally, at Zoom coffee hour today, we will have birthday and anniversary blessings for the month of September. My apologies for neglecting that uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, when we gathered for worship on the first Sunday of September. So we'll do that um, at Zoom coffee hour after church. We begin our worship this morning with our prelude. Again, welcome.
God is spirit, and those who worship must worship in spirit and in truth. Let us confess our sins to God. God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves, and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love and serve only your will. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. O oh God, make speed to save us. O oh Lord, make haste to help us. Praise to the holy and undivided Trinity, one God, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Christ has triumphed over death. O oh, come, let us worship. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us come before God's presence with thanksgiving. And praise to the Lord, shout the psalms. For you are a great God. You are great above all gods. In your hand are the caverns of the earth. And the heights of the hills are your Lord's also. The sea is yours, for you made it. And your hands have molded the water. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee. And kneel before the Lord our Maker. For you are our God and we are the people of your pasture and the sheep of your hand. O oh, let us today give our heart to your voice. Christ has triumphed over death. O oh, come, let us worship. The psalm appointed for today is number 105. The psalm is read responsibly, breaking at the asterisk. Give thanks to the Lord and call upon God's name. Make known the deeds of the Lord among the people. Sing to the Lord, sing praises. And speak of all God's marvelous works. Glory in God's holy name. Search for the Lord and the strength of the Lord. Continually seek the face of God. Remember the marvels God has done. The wonders and the judgments of God's mouth. O offspring of Abraham, God's servant. O children of Jacob, God's chosen. God led out the chosen people with silver and gold. In all their tribes, there was not one. Egypt was glad of their going. Because they were afraid of them. God spread out a cloud for a covering. And the fire to give light to the night season. They asked and quails appeared. And God satisfied them with bread from heaven. God opened the rock and water flowed. So the river ran into the dry places. For God remembered the holy promise. And the neighbor so God led forth the people with gladness. The children of one with shouts of joy. God gave those chosen people the lands of the nations. And they took the fruit of other soil. That they might keep God's statutes. And preserve the laws of the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise to the holy and undivided Trinity. One God, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. The first lesson. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. And the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you. And each day, 
The people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way, I will test them, whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, in the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard you complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. The response is the song of Ze Zechariah, read responsively, breaking at the asterisk. Blessed are you, Lord, the God of Israel. You have come to your people and set them free. You have raised up for us a mighty Savior. Born in the house of your servant David. Through your holy prophets you promised of old to save us from our enemies. From the hands of all who hate us. To show mercy to our forebears. And to remember your holy covenant. This was the oath you swore to our fa father Abraham. To set us free from the hands of our enemies. Free to worship you without fear. Holy and righteous before you all the days of our life. A new child shall be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare the way. To give God's people knowledge of salvation. By the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God. The dawn from on high shall break upon us. To shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death. Grace of the Holy and Undivided Trinity, one God, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen.
Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing around here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay. Beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought that they would receive more. But each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. <clears throat> but he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. O oh Lord, may your word only be spoken, and may your word only be heard. In the name of Jesus Christ, the living word, amen. So just like last week, this week we have another challenging parable from Jesus. <clears throat> and as we know, Jesus, uh, parables are one of Jesus' favorite ways to instruct us who try to be disciples about the ways of God. And as we are reminded over and over again, the way God does things is not usually how we do things. And I remind us of what has become my current favorite definition of a parable. A parable is a lit stick of dynamite wrapped in a story. It's no accident that this definition comes from a man named Clarence Jordan, a New Testament scholar who, with his wife Florence and another couple, started an interracial community in Americus, Georgia, in the heart of the Jim Crow South in 1942. Talk about a stick of dynamite. Koinonia Farms remains a working farm dedicated to living New Testament principles and teaching nonviolence and racial reconciliation. It sells delicious pecans and other gift items and welcomes visitors who want to learn about how they do things. Habitat for Humanity also got its start at Koinonia Farms in the 1960s. Our parable today features several shifts of day laborers, a manager and a landowner, who invites the workers to come work in his vineyard. When the end of the day comes, the workers who show up just before quitting time get the same daily wage as those who have been slaving away since the crack of dawn. It reminds me of those annoying folks that we all know who habitually show up at the last minute when all the work has been done and ask, is there anything I can do to help? It should be noted that the Greek word under the phrase, the usual daily wage, is denarius, a Roman silver coin. 
And according to the most recent sources I've consulted, the value of this coin took care of the basic needs, not more, but the basic needs of a landless laborer in first century Palestine. So the first and the last of the laborers get enough to meet their basic needs. We're not told why the different groups of workers arrive at different times. We're not told why the landowner didn't seem to know how much help he was going to need at the beginning of the day. We don't know why no one had invited the last group of laborers to work. So I wonder where the dynamite in this story affects you. If you're like me, the story makes me a bit grumbly, like the first workers who arrived at the crack of dawn. We go, perhaps, right to the feeling of, that's not fair. The workers who showed up at the end of the day don't deserve the same wage as the workers who worked hard all day. The first workers earned their money. The slackers who came at the end of the day, however, got away with not working. What's the boss thinking? But many of us are probably also thinking, in part, I know I'm not supposed to think that. I'm evolved enough as a Christian to know that I'm supposed to see the landowner as God and to be generous like God. And I think we'd be right about that conclusion, but we'd still be resentful. And we'd also likely be thinking, that's no way to run a business. And besides the kingdom of heaven, that's for later. That's not for now. Which misses the point of the story. And part of us knows that too. So the dynamite has blown everything apart. And we're not sure just how to put everything back together. And that's okay. Because we don't do the reassembly alone. At the heart of the resentment is that many of us think, I believe, that we're entitled to much of what we have in our lives because we believe we have earned it. But I have to say, gently, with some trepidation, not only to you, but to me, to all of us, that that's not necessarily always so. Some basic things that many of us take for granted are actually privileges that we have never really examined because we haven't had to. For example, owning a home, the staple of the American dream for many millions of people for many, many years. I wonder how many of us participating in this worship service this morning, or maybe you're reading this sermon at some other time, I wonder how many of us who have taken out mortgages ever considered the possibility, even for a moment, that we might not have gotten a mortgage because of the color of our skin. I wonder if that ever occurred to many of us. To illustrate, the GI Bill signed by President Roosevelt in 1944, towards the end of the Second World War, opened home ownership to millions of veterans through government-issued low-interest, zero-down-payment mortgages. Only a tiny fraction of eligible African-American veterans received that benefit. For example, according to one study, in the years immediately after the war, in the New York and northern New Jersey suburbs, about 67,000 mortgages were insured by the GI Bill, but fewer than 100 were taken out by non-white veterans. 67,100. Banks rarely underwrote mortgages in black neighborhoods. Real estate brokers rarely showed homes in white neighborhoods to potential black buyers because of restricted co- restrictive covenants and outright racism. Black veterans and their families weren't invited into the vineyard, so to speak. Indeed, they were kept out. And so the greatest homeowning boom ever in America, that post-war, 
a housing boom, the greatest engine of intergenerational wealth transfer in our nation's history was effectively closed to the greatest generation of African Americans. And though it's been illegal since the Fair Housing Bill of 1968, many studies show that the color of one's skin is still a problem when it comes to receiving mortgages, even today. I don't know about you who have homes or have had homes, but Jamie, my wife, and I bought our first house because our homeowning parents helped us with the down payment. And their homeowning parents had helped them with the down payment. And no one looking at us hesitated to sell us the house that we wanted. Now, Jamie and I had also worked hard and saved money, but we hadn't lifted a finger to be white. Now, I invite us to hear this parable in a different way, through a different lens. And let me set it up for us in this fashion. As a society, I believe, by and large, that we measure our worth, consciously or unconsciously, by the amount of money we make, the quantity of material goods that we accumulate, by competing, comparing, striving, by collecting accomplishments, by being first. Life is something of a zero-sum game, we think. And, as I suggested earlier, at times we hold on to the fantasy that what we have accomplished is primarily due to our own efforts. And by world standards, most everyone gathered here this morning, wherever you are, um, is wealthy. And even though living in the greater Boston area is a serious challenge, a serious challenge, most of us have enough. We are familiar with jealousy, however. Uh, the passage this morning uses the literal phrase in Greek for jealousy, the evil eye, we experience that jealousy. We experience what the Buddhists call comparative mind. We're always kind of trying to see where we are compared with other people. And so when we hear a parable about earning a living, perhaps these are the places where we go to proving our worth, to ideas of life as a sum, zero, a zero sum game. If someone else has, then I must not have. We begrudge what others may have. But what if we made a simple substitution as we reread this parable. I got this idea from the chat feature on Facebook in an online preaching group I'm in. What if we substituted the word love, the word love, for words having to do in the parable with money, with hiring, with pay, with wages, with transactions, comparison, order of worth, and so forth? What would happen? if we substituted the word love in those places. Listen to this and see how it feels. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out, who went out early in the morning to love laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily love, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and I will love you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has loved us. He said to them, you also, go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their love, beginning with the last and going to the first. When those loved, about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily love. Now when the first came, they thought that they would receive more love. But each of them also received the usual daily love. 
And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last only worked one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat? But he replied to one of them, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily love? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to love this last the same as I love you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So, the last will be loved and the first will be loved. What does that feel like for you? Doesn't that feel like what we really need? That this parable is really about love, our radical equality before God who lavishes love on us all, regardless? The first as well as the last, like any parent who loves all her children, no one more or less than the other, that there is enough, more than enough for all. Think of how God gives manna to the Israelites, just overflowing with quail and manna. There's enough. Well, I'm sure that this parable is in part straightforwardly about the economics of the marketplace and that God desires that all humans have the dignity of work and a living wage. I think it's also about the radical, lavish, overflowing, unfair quality of God's love for all. God wants to love all people into the vineyard. God wants to love all people into the vineyard. The question is, do we? I invite you to stand as able for the creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Hear our cry, O God, and listen to our prayer. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Help us, O God, our Savior. Deliver us and forgive us our sins. Look upon your congregation. Give to your people the blessing of peace. Declare your glory among the nations. And your wonders among all peoples. Do not let the oppressed be shamed and turned away. 
Never forget the lies of your world. Continue your loving kindness to those who know you. And your favor to those who are true of heart. Satisfy us by your loving kindness in the morning. So shall we rejoice and be glad all the days of our life. Grant us, O Lord, not to be anxious about earthly things, but to love things heavenly. And even now, while we are placed among things that are passing away, to hold fast to those that shall endure. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. O merciful Creator, your hand is open to satisfy the needs of every living creature. Make us always thankful for your loving providence and grant that we, remembering the account that we must one day give, may be faithful stewards of your good gifts. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. God of all power and love, we give you thanks for your unfailing presence and the hope you provide in times of uncertainty and loss. Send your Holy Spirit to enkindle in us your holy fire. Revive us to live as Christ's body in the world, a people who pray, worship, learn, break bread, share life, heal neighbors, bear good news, seek justice, rest, and grow in the Spirit. Wherever and however we gather, Unite us in common prayer and send us in common mission, that we and the whole creation might be restored and renewed through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite your prayers and petitions, either silently or aloud or in the chat feature in Facebook. Though we gather physically distanced, we remain in one spirit. We give thanks for our Manna siblings at the cathedral and Jennifer McCracken, their pastor, and for our siblings at St. Luke's in Lazio, Haiti, Father Jean Milor, their pastor. We pray for Michael, our presiding bishop, Alan and Gail, our bishops, Amy, dean of the cathedral, Carol, our regional canon, and Nick, our priest, and all bishops, priests, deacons, and lay ministers. We pray for holy audacity in our church to build true and sacred equality among all races and peoples. Created as we are in your image, hearing stories, turning hearts, making change. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for our Jewish brothers and sisters as they celebrate the high holy days. We give you thanks for those serving the common good during this time of pandemic, especially healthcare and cleaning professionals, medical researchers and clinical trial participants, manufacturers of personal protective equipment, store clerks and delivery people. In this back to school season, we pray for those juggling work and childcare responsibilities. And especially, We pray for hopeful endurance for teachers and school administrators and a safe return to school. Preserve us from all groundless fears and unwise risks. Gift us with holy patience. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. In this election season, we pray for a spirit of fair play, understanding, and tolerance in our political system and our civic culture. For Charlie, Joe, and Donald, for all our courts and all our legislatures, for those who serve as protectors of the public safety and in our armed forces, especially Sean, Ian, Jack, Colin, Tim, and Andrew, may your justice prevail. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for John, Toth, Bob C. Sr., Walter, Bob, Patsy, Sarah, Michael, Gail, Thomas, Bob, Susan, 
Steve, James, Cynthia, Chuck, Mark, Bill, Ruth, Linda, all singers and instrumentalists whose ministry is vital at this time, John, James, Nick M, Gail, Mary Ann and family, and Linda Evans. We ask that you give all cancer fighters comfort in their suffering, shrinking, and destroying all cancerous tumors according to your will. We pray for all of us who suffer from COVID-19, from unemployment, from racial injustice, and senseless gun violence. We pray for those fighting fires in California, Oregon, and throughout the West, and for those rebuilding after hurricanes. Are there others to name? Barbara. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. The altar flowers are given to the glory of God and in memory of Hester Guild, Edith B. McKinnon, Edwin and Esther Braley, B. Braley, Eleanor Sharon, and Earl Braley. Are there others to remember? And we remember Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Ascribe to the Lord the honor that is due. Bring offerings and come to the courts of the Holy One. I invite you now, if you're able to, click on um, the link in your bulletin if you'd like to make a gift at this time, or there should be a link in the Facebook chat as well in order for you to uh, give an offering. Thank you. 
Let us pray. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O God, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who make the journey with us. So be swift in love and make haste to be kind. And the blessing of God who made us, who loves us, and who travels with us, 
be with you now and forever. Amen. I enjoy to, uh, invite you to enjoy our, pre our postlude and then to join us uh, at coffee hour on Zoom.